I, I saw the film Casting By at the Atlanta Film Festival this past week, and uh, I have to say I was truly impressed with it, Just not just as a film but as an education in a lot of ways because the, the art of casting has been cloaked in a certain sort of mystery, and I thought this, the movie really raised that, that curtain of mystery. It's amazing that we all were, were blind to the role of the casting director and nobody really ever thought about, hey, who put the actors in this movie? <laughs> yeah. It's a it's it's very fascinating. I wanted to I wanted to begin by asking you you know the movie the movie covers you know casting how casting was done in pre fifties Hollywood um, when studios had contract players you know if there were no casting directors then then who exactly in the hierarchy of, of filmmaking then did the casting I mean who actually picked all not just the lead roles because you figure those were done by the studios, but you know when Franklin Pangborn and, and Eugene Paulette had to be cast, you know who who put those actors in? Right. Well, it, it's not true that there were no casting directors, but you have to mm-hmm. look at them more as studio functionaries. They were more like the head of the casting department, which would have been the human resources department. The studio right. had a, a huge number of actors under contract. And they also had talent scouts that would roam around to put actors under contract. Uh, mm-hmm. But and a lot of those were actually men, uh, middle-aged guys who had just come out of World War II, and, and their job became, you know, dealing with the uh, employee roles and the salaries of the contract players. But mm-hmm. it was not in any way a creative role. Uh, you know, it, it became a free agent kind of role, where the or the actors became free agents after the 50s and 60s. And suddenly, then it was like, how do we find these actors? And that's where people like Marion Doherty and Lynn Stallmaster and Fred Roos kind of came into existence. Right. Now, when you began the project, uh, and I know uh, I know, it must have taken you, how long did the project take you to, to finish? Well, I was, I was around asked three to interview. Years. Yeah, I was asked to interview Marion in 06. The first few interviews were 08. And it was 10, 2010, before we really started rolling, and we ended up doing over 220 interviews. So, did you? So, you already had settled on Marion Doherty as the film's through line, or was that an element that sort of took you by surprise as you were gathering your footage? Marion Doherty was my way in because I was asked mm-hmm. by a casting director if I knew her. Uh, I know, you know, there's this legendary casting director in her mid 80s who nobody has ever put on tape, and she's got an amazing story. Uh, and as it turned out, there was someone who put her on tape back in 2002. And if you remember the uh, the, the mini DV footage of Marion's interview in her pink outfit, that actually is an interview from O2 that I was able to uh, to license. So, oh, okay. but however, of course, that was the only existing interview with Marion Doherty, this incredibly legendary woman. Uh, and so I, I knew from the beginning that Marion was probably the heart of the story. Uh, however, I I went in and kind of immersed myself into the world of casting by interviewing, I would say, a hundred other casting directors and another hundred actors who had whose lives had been changed or deeply affected by casting directors before I really could be confident to say, yes, Marion Doherty is, is the pioneer. Mm-hmm. Well, it was, uh, it was remarkable uh, how many actors felt they owed a major part of their career to Marion's casting decisions. I, I find it even when I watch the film, and I my jaw still drops every time I you know I watch the film because it's like oh my god the sting oh all in the family it's just it's, it's endless that all of this could have happened because of this woman this one it, person it, it, it's really remarkable I mean she strikes me at least in her in her interviews as extremely humble uh, and just some, somewhat of an ultimate fan of actors I mean that's was was that what, how you found her. Yes, I mean, if you remember, you probably don't remember, but the the first line she says in the film is, to be a good casting director, you have to love actors. And that is absolutely the core of what made Marion great. Yeah. I'm curious, do you think do you think it's safe to say that without the New York-based casting director, which she was, she was you know, uh, kind of the queen of that, you know, of that world, do you, is it, do you think it's safe to say that without that kind of casting director, that that last golden age of movies that reached from 67 to, say, 82 might not have had the ultimate punch that it had? Yeah, I think without having – and it's not just Marion Doherty. There were other people 
that were as great as Marion, uh, but Marion was the queen. And without those people having an eye for great acting, then, yeah, I don't think you would have found the De Niro's and the Pacino's and, uh, you know, all the guys that I grew up uh, that made me love movies. Mm. I, I think that's very true. I think if you had had studio functionaries fanning out in New York looking for actors, you know, there might have been trouble. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I'm curious to to know the process by which your movie was shaped. I mean, how much footage do you, did you ultimately have? Because uh, it must have been a tremendous. I, I know that you're an editor. Uh, you started off in editing, but uh, you know this must have been a real bear to try and and tear <clears throat> down to 90 minutes. That it was. My wife actually edited the film and. and is brilliant and did an amazing job. And you just need to be a, a very obsessive compulsive and, and have an eye for detail. And her eye for detail is greater than mine. I'll go up to 80% and say we're there and she'll just keep going till she gets past a hundred. And it, it, it's what's made the film so good. I think it's her contribution, but uh, the, uh, I would say it's an infinite amount of footage because there were so many TV shows and there were so many movies that could have been incorporated that you really had to just understand the spine of the film and and stay with that. And mm. uh, it took a year and a half to edit, so it took a mm. long time. You talked to a ridiculously huge number of film figures in the movie, I mean, from De Niro, Pacino, Scorsese, Woody Allen, so many more, and plus all the casting directors like Lynn Stallmaster and Julia Taylor. Are there any sort of chats or stories that they imparted uh, well, you know, it's, it's funny. Incredibly it's incredible. memorable, but yeah. had to be cut. <laughs> you know. Oh, I'm. Uh, God, I'm, there were so many. One would be uh, I interviewed George Lucas, who was mm-hmm. an amazing interview, and he talked about Fred Roos, who's another genius casting director out of uh, Los Angeles, and uh, we talked about the casting of American Graffiti. So I interviewed uh, Richard Dreyfuss, uh, Cindy Williams, Fred Roos, George Lucas, and it's an incredible sequence that Jill cut five minutes long about how Fred, you could give a lot of the credit to the success of American Graffiti to Fred's incredible casting. And unfortunately, it just didn't fit in the film because as the film narrowed its focus more and more to Marion with Lynn Stallmaster as the B story, there was no room for Fred's story, no matter how great. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that happened time and time again. I mean, there's Mike Fenton in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. There's you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. There's a great story regarding E.T. There's Morgan Freeman being typecast as, as a, ch- a child actor in the uh, in, uh, electric company who then mm-hmm. takes the role of a pimp and totally changes uh, because the casting director believes that he can do that. And it totally right. changes his career. That's another great story. And that, of course, ultimately didn't fit the spine of the film. So there are many of those stories. And regarding research, you know, Lynn Stolmaster would go into his closet and pull out three garbage bags filled with archival that nobody has seen before except for Lynn. And a few of those oh things gosh. were uh, the graduate shortlist. So it'd be, you know, uh, Benjamin with the list of actors or, you know, Mrs. Robinson with the list of actors all typed out with notes next to them. <laughs> uh, God, I, I just don't see how you got your head around all of this. I really don't. Uh, you know, you have I to just... really love the subject. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, it's an easy subject to love because, he, you know, again, you, one of the things I always say about documentary filmmakers is that there, there, needs, to be, uh, there needs to be a sense of discovery uh, in a documentary film uh, that's, that's being experienced by the filmmaker himself. You're so right. I'm doing, I'm doing a new doc right now on military veterans, on veterans in the U.S. military, and I, I kind of come in knowing what every American knows about veterans. But what I know now is so much more because of that process of interviewing a hundred people and what I've discovered through them and their documents. It's been an amazing, it's always an amazing experience when you make a documentary. Yeah. Doherty, Marion Doherty was particularly great because she was, you know, kind of able to sense an inner life and all the actors she, she worked with and, and match elements of their inner lives with the characters that she was charged to cast. Do, Do you feel that this, the art of casting is under a certain sort of transformation now because, you know, in my opinion, most actors now seem to be cast for their looks alone and and not for any kind of inner life that they might have. Do you feel that this is a fair assessment? Do you, you know, I, I think it's fair to say a lot of, of casting is done that way. There's a lot of uh, more control from the top now. However, that said, there are still incredible casting directors trained by the Marion and Lynn School, like, for instance, Laura Kennedy, who's the head of casting at Warner Brothers, who put together that cast for Argo. And uh, 
did an amazing, amazing job. And, and Ben Affleck gave her the freedom to do what she wanted to do. So that absolutely still exists. It's not just the, the Martin Scorsese's and Woody Allen's whose casting directors have total freedom, but there are, there are casting directors in Hollywood whose directors get it. And, and I think our film will help inspire directors to let casting directors do what they need to do to make a cast great. I think you're right about but that. But I, I do think, yeah, I do think there's hope. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. And I, I, and I think the film imparts that, that uh, a, a sense of hope. So that's good. Um, let me ask you this: Why do you think it is that most most of the most successful casting directors are female? I mean, do well, you think I mean, it has something you know, to do with intuition or? Well, yeah, it's funny. I asked Lynn that question, and Lynn said, "You know, it's because Marion and I hired a lot of women." And, of course, then you have to ask, after laughing, you have to ask, why did you hire women? And the answer I get from every cast, almost every casting director I asked, over 100, that it is, there, there's an intuition, there is a, an ability to nurture, whereas I think men are like, go, 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 competitive, competitive, and, and women are much more like, let's build a team, and let's see how that team can work together. I just think they're a little more thoughtful in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would say that's, that's probably the reason. The other reason Juliet Taylor told me is that back in the 60s and 70s, men didn't want those jobs because they were so low paid mm. that they ended up hiring women. That's fascinating. I mean, that, that's – well, that leads perfectly to my my next question. How, how, how rampant is sexism in Hollywood, and how does that element of Hollywood figure into the downplaying of the casting director? Uh, well, very good question. You know, I asked Marion the first, uh, I said, hey, so give me some examples of sexism when you were working on craft television theater. And she said, sexism? What's that? So that was that generation's view of sexism. <laughs> she just <laughs> dealt with it. Uh, uh, yes. I mean, I think, uh, I think, I mean, I didn't want to say it in the film. I didn't think I needed to hit it over the head. But of course, sexism plays a huge role in, in casting directors being kept down. If you look at the Directors Guild, there's I think six to nine or at the most 12 females who are directors in the director's guild or feature mm. film directors anyway. Uh, right. And in the CSA, I think 75% of the members are female. So I think you can do the math. Yeah, exactly. One of the most interesting things in the film is when you have Taylor Hackford sitting there talking about, talking about the reasons why he doesn't believe that casting directors need to be recognized uh, Specifically by the uh, by the Academy Awards, um, and he seemed to be saying that you know, to me it seemed to be he seemed to be saying that that he was you know the director is the ultimate the ultimate authority as to who will be cast or not. But is, right. do you think that the reason that the Directors Guild is lobbying against there being a casting Oscar is because they you know the directors want to give everyone the illusion that they they are solely the ones responsible for the casting? I mean, do you think this is the case? And and how I, much I does the so. director I, have to do with the casting process? Well, the director has a lot to do with the casting process, just like they have a lot to do with building the walls and editing the movie. Uh, right. You know, it's telling in that the first line in our film is Martin Scorsese saying casting is 95% of directing. Mm. He doesn't say casting is 95% of filmmaking. He says 95% of directing. So I think that, that says a lot. So if you take the credit of casting away from or give it or share it with someone else, then in Scorsese's view anyway, you're taking you know, away 95% of what a director does. So I think uh, in terms of territoriality, that's a big part of it. They don't want to give up that turf because that's, part, that's a lot of what makes the director feel like their, their contribution has been. People always say, oh, my God, you put Julia Roberts in that movie. That was a brilliant casting idea. Oh, thank you. I knew she was right for the role when she walked in the room. You know, well, the reality is the director wasn't in the room. The reality was, you know, she was put on videotape and, and or called back to see the director after the casting director went through a thousand other choices. Right. Or... The casting director saw Julia Roberts, and she had black hair, and they said, dye your hair blonde, don't wear that dress, wear jeans, and now I'm going to have you meet the director. And also, you know, I want you to stutter, or I want you to have an accent, or, you know, all of that is kind of pre-directed in a lot of cases before they actually meet the director. For the director right. to then say, when that actor walked in the room, I knew they were right for the part. <laughs> <laughs> With all this in mind, with uh, with you know the territoriality of the directors and the and the guild and so forth, do you think 
Do you think there's ever any kind of hope? Because we've uh, we've said on the show many times uh, uh, that there should be a casting Oscar. Do you think there's ever any kind of hope? Oh, that there will be a I casting have no Oscar? doubt in my I have no doubt in my mind. And I asked Marion Doherty before she passed away, and she said there will be a casting Oscar. It's just a matter of time. So I have no doubt, and I think the film will help make that happen. And we'll see what happens. As Alan Lewis said, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, the next year after the film comes out. So when is it set to when is casting by set to air on HBO? Yeah, we don't have an official date yet except to say it's uh it's in the summer. 